Today, we're going to calculate an independent samples t-test by hand. Stay tuned. So far on this channel, we've talked a lot about the logic behind null hypothesis significance tests, such as the t-test. And last week, we calculated a one-sample t-test comparing a sample mean to a known population mean. In psychology research, however, we don't usually have a population mean that is known for us to compare against. So instead, we usually have two sample means, for example, from an experimental group and a control group. In order to, what did you just do? Did you just hit the like button? I like you too. Did, oh, oh my God, you subscribed? Oh, you're the best. Okay, well, thank you. To demonstrate an independent samples t-test, I'm gonna walk you through some data from an experiment I recently did. So to set up the experiment, I'm gonna tell you a little backstory. It all starts back in 1994, when the Razorbacks had just won the NCAA championship. In those days, nobody was more important. But for the next flight, I had a layover in Atlanta, and a guy in the restroom there said, I love that shirt, but and that old cowboy was 80 if he was a day. And he said, boy, where did you learn to ride like that? And he was so polite. I said, yes, Keanu, I think you should definitely do the matrix. So then I, I was thinking maybe next time don't use so much hairspray. Lesson learned, popular at the time. So that got me thinking, who gets more attention on social media, men or women? In order to find out, I decided to set up four Facebook accounts with pictures of men in the profile and four Facebook accounts with pictures of women in the profile. And without contacting anyone, I just waited to see how many friend requests each of them got. So my independent variable, the thing I'm manipulating is male or female Facebook profiles. And the thing I'm measuring, my dependent variable, would be number of friend requests in the first 24 hours. Okay, so now to analyze this kind of data, we need to do something called an independent samples t-test, right? Because we're gonna be looking at two groups of data, two uh, samples that are uh, independent from each other. Now, when you do an independent samples t-test, you're making the following assumptions. Uh, first, that the data are on an interval or ratio scale, and ours are. Uh, the data points are independent. In other words, um, the, the nobody's, uh, you know, no profile is in both groups, for example. Uh, the data are normally distributed, and that there are no crazy outliers. And finally, homogeneity of variance, which basically means the variance between the two groups is similar. The independent samples t-test is very similar to the one sample t-test that we've already done, but there's one important difference. Because we have two groups, for some of the formulas, we need to pool the groups together. So for example, the standard deviation, we need to take the standard deviations of the two groups, pool them together so that we have one number. Uh, same is true for the standard error and so on and so forth. So that's going to be the main difference between an in one sample t-test and an independent samples t-test. So here's our data set. Now we're going to start by writing down just our hypotheses. And the null hypothesis is, of course, that the mu from which sample one is drawn is equal to the mu or the population mean from which sample two is drawn. The alternative would be that mu of the males is not equal to the mu of the females. So we're doing a two-tailed test here. Now, we need to look up our critical value of t. In order to do that, we need to go ahead and calculate our degrees of freedom, which degrees of freedom. And the problem is we have two degrees of freedom. We have two groups, so we're gonna have two different values for degrees of freedom. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna simply add the degrees of freedom in group one to the degrees of freedom in group two. So our total degrees of freedom 
for the test is going to equal to df1 plus df2. So that's going to be n minus 1 for group 1 plus n minus 1 for group 2. So that is going to be our n minus 1 is simply 4 minus 1 is 3 and the same in the other group. So 3 plus 3 which is going to give us 6. Now we can go to our handy dandy t table. There's one available at ttable.org and we are going to go down to our degrees of freedom. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and then across to our alpha level which we're going to choose set as 0 0.05 for the two-tailed test and that is going to be a 2.447. So that's the number to beat in our t-test 2.447. Any number larger than that we're going to say there was a significant difference between the groups. Any number smaller than that we're going to say there was not a significant difference. Okay, next we need to calculate some means. Now that we have everything sort of set up, let's calculate the mean of group one and the mean of group two. The mean of group one is gonna be uh, five, six, seven, eight divided by four, which is two. And the mean of group two is gonna be 10, 11, 12, 16 divided by four, which is four. So far, so good. I'm just going to write those numbers down just so that I can keep track of them. Next, we're going to calculate the sum of squares, the degrees of freedom we've already calculated, and we're going to do something called pooling the variance. So instead of calculating the variance for each one of these groups separately, we're going to calculate them together. Because we have two groups, we have to pool the groups together to get the pooled variance. The procedure is going to look fairly familiar if you've done this before with another kind of t-test or standard deviation. Basically, we're gonna take the sum of squares, so that's gonna be x minus x bar, and then we're gonna square it for each data point. So let me write x minus x bar, and then squared for each data point. So we're gonna do group one, so this is gonna be three minus 2, 2 minus 2, 2 minus 2, 1 minus 2. So that's x minus x bar. Now we need to square each of those. So 3 minus 2 is uh, gives us 1 squared, 0 squared, 0 squared, and minus 1 squared. If we calculate that out, then 1 squared is 1, 0 squared is 0, and negative one squared is uh, also one. Okay, so there is our squares. Now we need to sum them to get the sum of squares. So our sum of squares for group one is going to be uh, two. And our sum of squares for group two, we need to calculate. So we've got six minus four, four minus four, 2 minus 4 and 4 minus 4. If we square that, we're going to get uh, 6 minus 4 is going to give us 2 squared. 4 minus 4 is 0 squared. 2 minus 4 is negative 2 squared. And 4 minus 4 is 0 squared. Now, if we calculate those out, we get 4, 0, 4, and zero. So our sum of squares for group two is actually equal to eight. Four plus four is eight. Okay, so I'm going to have these kind of separated out over here on this side. Degrees of freedom for uh, the first group was uh, four minus one is three. And for group two, they have the same size, sample size, so that's also going to be three. Now, when we go down here to calculate our pooled variance, it's quite easy. We just take sum of squares from group one plus sum of squares from group two, and we divide by degrees of freedom from group one plus degrees of freedom from group two, 
we get 10 divided by 6, which if you do the math, that equals 1.667. Okay, now that we have our pooled variance, we can calculate a pooled standard deviation, which we're gonna need later. And the simplest way to do that is that the variance is just the squared standard deviation. So all we have to do is take the variance and take the square root of it. So the square root of 1.667 gives us 1.29. Now we also need to calculate the standard error for the t-test. And in this case, we're gonna use the variance and the sample sizes. And here's our formula. So we're just gonna plug in numbers here. We're gonna take the square root of 1.67 over, sample size of group one is four, plus 1.67 divided by four. By my calculations, this is, is also the same as 0 0.418 plus 0 0.418, which equals the square root of 0 0.835, which equals, if you do the math, 0 0.913. Okay, now, now that we have our standard error, we can calculate our value of t. So t is simply the difference between the two sample means divided by the standard error. And the difference between the sample means was two minus four. In fact, because it's arbitrary which group you put first, males or females, which should be first, uh, it doesn't matter. So just to make our lives easier, we're gonna actually put the bigger number first that way we don't have to deal with a negative number. It wouldn't matter if we did, but uh, this just makes it a little easier. 0 0.913 goes on the bottom. So that's two divided by 0 0.913, which is equal to 2.191. So now we can ask the question, did we have a statistically significant difference between male and female profiles? We compare this number to our critical value of T and our number was not bigger than our critical value, and therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There was not a statistically significant difference. It was close, but you know what they say, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. The last step that we haven't done is we haven't calculated our effect size, Cohen's D. So that's gonna be four minus two divided by the standard deviation, which we found to be 1.29, so that's two divided by 1.29, which equals 1.55. Small, medium, and large for Cohen's D, the cutoffs are 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8. So 0 0.8 and higher would be a large effect size. So this would be a large effect size if it were statistically reliable. So now we know the answer to the question. Do males or females differ in the amount of attention they get on social media? According to our data, we didn't have enough evidence to detect a reliable difference. But that's how you calculate an independent samples t-test by hand. One quick note about that data set. I deliberately kept our data set small so that we wouldn't have to do as many hand calculations. But when you see an effect size that's as big as the one that we saw, and it's not statistically significant, Sometimes that can mean that we lacked something called power. And that means our sample size wasn't big enough to detect an effect that was really there. We'll have a video on power coming up in the near future. Anyway, that's how you calculate an independent samples t-test by hand. I hope you found this video useful. If so, like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a question. We've got more videos on the way on the science of psychology and some statistics you might need to do some psychology. Until next time, keep thinking.